Joe was little, you know, he was, just, at first he was like a little skinny little surfer boy. Um, always liked to be outside, playing outside. He loved to be outside. To get him in the house, it was hard. He was a happy-go-lucky little kid, always smiling. He was like my little best friend. He never showed any signs of um, trouble at all that we would have upon, you know, later on in life with him. I knew he had a drug-related problem. I didn't know how bad it was, but it was terrible. He got worse and worse and to the point where I couldn't stand him anymore. I didn't want him under my house. I didn't like him here. I didn't trust him. Uh, he wasn't my son. I don't know who he was. He was the devil, really. That's all I can, that's the best way to describe him. He was overpowered by a demon, by this drug. Do you want to spend, do you want to spend three to seven years in jail, Joe, or do you want to go to rehab for a year? What do you think sounds better, Joe? And on fentanyl, he was, he, he was pretty out of it. His body would get so relaxed that he looked like he was dead. You know, he would lay back and, and his mouth would just drop open and, and uh, it was, it, it's pretty, it's harrowing to, to watch your son um, go through this. Joey! Joe, let's go. Joe! Joe! It was a really hard, but like I didn't want to leave him. So I just couldn't like, you know, get my ground. Um, I want to make sure he was okay too. I've overdosed twice. The first time it had to be fentanyl. The second time I overdosed was straight fentanyl. All I remember is putting on the radio, listening to music and have a butt. And then boom, I woke up in the ambulance. My aspirations were to start a family and everything. I mean, that's what I was thinking about, but it didn't happen. Drugs has gone the way. I just started doing Percocets every day. I progressed from doing Percocets every day to doing dope every day. I mean, I always, I knew fentanyl was in it. I knew it was cut with it. I started knowing when it was totally fentanyl, and my buddy told me it was, it's just fentanyl. And I only went to him because it was more powerful and you get more bang for your buck. It's pretty scary because most people don't see what I see every day. I manage a crematory in downtown Manchester. And the fentanyl, uh, I noticed a lot, the, the overdoses were coming more quicker. It was a lot more of them. Instead of getting one a week, I could get three a week. And I, a lot of times when I went and picked these bodies up, I wasn't sure if I was gonna go out and find my son. So we would park here a lot of times at night. I would be parked here till after midnight, one o'clock in the morning. We, we came down here to watch for him, to see if we saw him sitting on the sidewalk in a, in a stupor um, or just walking down the street in a daze. And there were times that we did. Sometimes he would see us and he would give us a signal like, stay back. Other times um, he didn't see us at all. And we would be like chasing after him. It got worse as time went on. We tried many different things with him. We kicked him out to give him the tough love because people said, give him tough love, kick him out. We kicked him out. That made it worse, he got into trouble. I was sleeping at the trap house. Trap house is where you can get anything you want. There's multiple dealers in there. I got arrested once for crack possession, once for attempted burglary, and that was in the same day. And I also slept in the cemetery. Um, behind a mausoleum. Probably one of the hardest things I ever did to throw one of my own children out of, out of my house that I always had a shelter for him, because you didn't know what he was doing out there. He didn't dare come back here. 
because he knew he'd be arrested. And I told him, you come back here and I'll call the police, you'll be arrested. I don't want you when they're here. You get better and they'll be fine. If you want help, we'll get you help. If you go back down there and keep doing that dope, you're going to die. I said, so it's up to you. Good thing I have the business card. I forgot the lady's name I'm meeting. Are we meeting someone else? A new person now? His wife and I are trying to, you know, Basically, if he went to a halfway house, they would be doing the same thing. You need to get a job, you need to make phone calls, you need to be more responsible. It's time to basically change your ways. Um, and is it tough? Yes. Um, it's very tough. Um, and he has told me that every day is a challenge for him. An addict alone is in its worst company, so it's like my mind is racing constantly, so I have to figure out stuff to do to keep my mind busy. There's a lot of demons in my head, you know? And it's like constant battle. I feel like there's like a war zone going on. Psychological warfare at its best. This time seems definitely different this time with his attitude and the way he's actually like stuck with things. Kind of is just like routine is different. Um, it's better than the last time when he came out of um, a rehab. He went right back to it. I write music. I um, listen to music. Um, it's more of like a way for me to get away from the world. I mean, I hate the world the way it is. So I write about it. On the path that I'm not even knowing I feel like a dream that awaits. I know that I see better days. Something tells me to just keep on going. Dream better ways. I know that I've seen better days. Something tells me to just keep on going. IOP is intensive outpatient program. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 8 to 11. Um, on Friday, my mom, you know, she has off, so she takes me and lets my wife sleep in because my wife, she works like crazy hours. So I wish I could just walk, but she doesn't like me to walk. She knows how I am. She knows that I'll just go right off track. I'm basically just trying to support him to stay strong um, and to and, and love him. I will always stand by him um, and try to help him, you know, stay strong for himself and fight this addiction. Um, I will always support him, um, you know, and remind him of things he should do and shouldn't do. No, you need to do it. They should have done it. I know, but it's your responsibility to make it. And you need well, to I make need it. it. Okay, and they didn't have it on their schedule, so. Well, then you need to talk to them and tell them that. I need to do two, though. Yeah, you do. All right, I love you. All right, I love you. I'm vulnerable. I feel about my situation right now. I feel like I'm vulnerable. I mean, 60 days, it's still, I'm still new to it all. That challenge of not going and hanging out with people that I used to hang out with, it's like maybe like three, four times a day. And I'm up from 8 in the morning till you know, 10, 11 at night. Three, four times a day, I want to go down there, yeah. Shame is a huge part of addiction for the families. Um, because with shame, um, you don't want people to know because people do look down on you. Um, I didn't let my family, my sisters know for a long time. And um, my, one of my sisters said, God, I wish you let me know. I would have helped you. Um, I've borrowed money from them. Joey has borrowed money from them. He pawned everything he could get his hands on, basically. Um, and Cash for Gold is where he pawned my wedding band set three times because he told us that he owed people money. And the last time that he pawned it, I didn't have my rings back for a whole year. I thought that they lived on We didn't have food. We were ashamed. You know, we didn't want anyone to know our story. Every day he would go to his mother's work. She'd give him money and more money and more money, and he had more lies. She called, cried to me one day, and she says, I've given him everything. She said, all my credit cards are maxed and they want, but they have money. 
I said, how much do you need and how much have you given them? Because she kept it from me, she lied to me. My wife lied to me first time. So then I knew there was a real problem. I ne my wife never lied to me. And she didn't want to tell me because I screamed. I said, don't give him any money. You understand? I used to scream every day. Don't give him any money. You call me. You tell me, I'll take care of it. But they gave him the money until it was all gone. Sometimes you and I are running scared through this life when we have no reason to be. When you have Jesus, you have everything that you need. Amen? What I did to my family has been the hardest this week I dealing with, sought out a book just because they're still there. And it's like, why? How are you still proud that I'm your son? How are you still proud to say I'm your husband? You and I have a hurt world all around us looking for encouragement. Our neighbors are desperate to see us apply real love to real needs of real people in the real world. He is starting to come back to us. Um, I see a lot of the old Joe, a lot of the younger Joe in him. Um, we are, you know, he likes to laugh a lot now. I think something clicked, maybe that switch went on in his head and maybe he wants to change. Maybe he saw the light. Maybe somebody came down, maybe some, I don't know. But right today, is my son is back again. This is me. This is who I am. This is who I want to be. I think I can do it. I feel like I can do it. I'm not going to say that I got this. It's the worst saying you can say. You never got it. I found out she had passed away uh, early Sunday morning. I got a knock on the door, and there was two sheriffs and um, a, a guy in plain clothes. And it didn't even cross my mind that that's what they were here for. And they came in and, you know, can you sit down? I said, sure, what's going on? And as soon as he said, we got a phone call from a detective in Florida, I knew, and I lost it. It's the most horrible feeling you'll ever have, and I don't think that I could ever be hurt like that again. Good morning. When Michelle Curran learned that her daughter, Micaiah, had died from an overdose of the opioid carfentanil this past summer. Her two grandsons, Lane and Reed, were still asleep in a room down the hall. She and her husband, Chuck, had been caring for the boys while their mother bounced in and out of rehab. It was supposed to be temporary, but Micaiah's death turned it into a permanent arrangement. From that moment on, the simple act of waking the boys in the morning would take on new meaning. Michelle would have to do it not just as grandma, but as mom. <laughs> The natural space that usually exists between a grandparent and her grandchildren was gone. It's hard to explain, it really is, because it's so devastating. And I don't think I'll ever be the same. I know I won't be. And it's all at one time. So I have this brand new responsibility. Not only do I have to bury my daughter, but now I have to explain to the boys why mommy's not coming back and I have to take on that responsibility of now I am mom. Eat your coma, buddy. Okay. Someone forgot yesterday. Oh yeah, because you didn't tell me to. For 47-year-old Michelle and Chuck, who is 63, it's back to making lunches, remembering play dates, taking care of school assignments, taking care of everything. I mean, I'm still grandma to them, we gotta go. but now I really am taking on the role of mom. And it's not fair. It's not fair to those boys. Lane is seven. He's a high-energy, boisterous kid with an insatiable need for hugs and kisses. And Lots of them. 
Reed is two years younger. He's quiet and laid back. His grandmother describes him as a little old man trapped in a five-year-old's body. They are among the thousands of children who have been affected by the widespread abuse of opioids that has pushed U.S. overdose rates to all-time highs. Traumatized by the mayhem of growing up with addicted parents, watching their mothers and fathers use drugs and OD. These children are often living in conditions which, when described, are painful to hear. There was not one stitch of food in that apartment, nothing. Piles of trash, trash littered all over the floor. Um, there was like these milk jugs and they were filled with vomit. In Vermont, the number of children entering the custody of the child protection system grew by 40% between 2013 and 2016. In West Virginia, the number of children in foster care grew by 24% between 2012 and 2016. And here in Ohio, opioids are the main cause of a 19% increase in the number of kids placed with relatives or foster homes since 2010. Ben is so empathetic and he is so kind. We can always depend on him to be in a good mood. He is always up and bubbly. He just, he makes everybody laugh. Stephanie Horton and her husband Doug first met Ben when they became his foster parents in 2009. He was a newborn going through painful withdrawal symptoms. Both of his biological parents had abused heroin, and Ben was born addicted to the drug. His mother dropped out of the picture early on, but his father, David McIntosh, got clean and regained custody of Ben when he was 20 months old. Stephanie stayed connected, helping out with babysitting. But it wasn't long before David relapsed. Ben began sharing alarming stories of life at home with the man he called his other daddy. So he would go and tell his preschool teacher that his other daddy would, um, would tie a rubber band around his arm and use a spoon and, and then he would be asleep is what he would say. He would get really, really sleepy and he would say, and I would try and wake up my other dad, but I couldn't wake him up. And he just wanted, you know, he would say things like, I just wanted to be stronger. I want bigger muscles. So when I shake him, he'll wake up. At home, Ben's dad would often sit him down to watch horror movies. The scenes would leave Ben so terrified and transfixed that he wouldn't bother his father while he was using drugs. It was 18 months before the Hortons were able to regain custody. They officially adopted Ben last year and are raising him along with their three biological children. This past spring, Ben's birth father died of an overdose of fentanyl and morphine. Here's my other daddy and me and that's me eating a donut, and then that's me and my other daddy looking at a comic book that I still got out here. My other daddy gave it to me. This four by six photo album, filled with pictures from his last supervised visit with David, is all Ben has to remember him. His mother Stephanie says she can already see some of Ben's memories with him starting to fade. But the trauma of those last months with his father, the effects of watching him in the throes of addiction, will be long-lasting. Ben suffers from post-traumatic stress disorder, bouts of mania and aggression. Without medication, he has trouble sleeping through the night. And his early exposure to horror films has made it hard for him to tell the difference between fiction and reality. The experiences have all blended together. At times, Ben can become so obsessive about his interests from superheroes to Harry Potter, that he alienates other children. Everything that he wants to do is big. Um, everything is very intense. Whenever he makes a birthday wish, whenever he um, has any type of wish or anything that he, he does like that, it's always to be strong, to have muscles. Because that was the experience that he had, was when people are laying down, they might not get up. So I need to have bigger muscles and I need to be stronger. This is Avengers chocolate milk that I used to call Avengers chocolate milk. But it's just Wager chocolate milk because now I understand it's just Wager chocolate milk. And I used to think if I drank this 100 times, I'll turn into superhero. But now I don't believe that. 
Ben's history, the trauma inflicted on him at a young age, will haunt him for years. The way that he looks at and sees the world is affected because of that. And that, as a mom, as his mom, has always immediately caused anger in me and frustration and resentment of he uh, everything I see him struggle with. Nice. Jolly, jolly, jolly snowman. It's the best time of the year. <laughs> Who knows what'll happen down the road, but I always have that fear in the back of my mind or one of the boys going to become, you know, addicted to something. And I have to cross that bridge, unfortunately. Back in Pataskala, both Lane and Reed seem to be adjusting. They've gone to counseling and done well. Still, with the holidays, they're first without their mother, it's hard. So as a way to remember her, the boys turned sand dollars, which Micaiah loved, into ornaments for the tree. Did mommy like fish too? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that's why I'm learning. Because I was making sure so I could do a fish. Oh yeah, mommy loved that. For Michelle and Chuck, the goal is simple. Take things day by day and soak up every minute even though at times it's in the sweetest moments that they realize their biggest fears. They'll crawl up in the chair with me uh, and sit with me. They do that all the time. Uh, we've kind of outgrown that oversized chair, uh, so we're gonna have to look for something like a love seat or something like that where all three of us can uh, uh, fit in there. But um, now I've always believed that The critical time for children is in their adolescence through their early teenage years, where they're the most um, vulnerable, I guess, uh, to uh, uh, things that happen. My biggest fear is, is I'll pass away before I can get them through that stage of life. We welcomed our elf by choosing the name Fred. Michelle and Chuck have just one last bit of paperwork to submit before the boys will be formally adopted, a new family unit. So we'll keep this as long as we can. I want to keep it forever. Yeah, and we'll have to transfer it to you boys when you get old, okay? and you have your own families. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I haven't opened this box in 10 months. Oh, oh man. This my everyday kit. I just carry this shit around with me every day. You know, imagine sticking that fucker in your arm six to ten times a day. This is the tie. You throw this fucker around your arm like this. See where that vein pops up right there? I'm lucky I don't have any scars. This is what a bundle looks like. But, uh, oh man, that one's fully dope. Look at that. I can't believe that's in there. How did I miss that? So I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of that. That's probably 120 or 130 bucks right there. That I could call any number of people and fucking sell this to right now. Or I could do it. Or I could get high. See, I was shooting four or five bags like this full. See, that's about a bundle right there. You get 10 of those little bags out of that. But now, 
I'm just gonna throw it in the garbage. The toilet, actually. Just cause I don't fucking need it. Just gonna let that shit go. And that's that. Hey, it's a good thing you were here when I opened the box. I can't guarantee how that would have gone if I was alone. It's crazy. Get rid of that later. My job as a prosecutor is not to run an assembly line of prosecution. Our job is to administer justice. Our job is to achieve the best public safety outcomes for the people of our county and our state. And our job is also to be wise and frugal with the taxpayer's dollar. Judge, um, the reality is that Ms. Follinsby uh, was the last link in a very long supply chain of heroin. The people who are in our program are individuals who have been in the revolving door of the criminal justice system typically. And if they haven't already been in the revolving door, they would soon be if not for the program. The courts are swamped with cases related to opioid use and abuse. It's changing the ways that we think about our community. I am aware of at least one situation where I contacted a person to talk about pretrial services and pre-charge, and uh, they expressed an interest but didn't follow up, and they overdosed and died. It drives home how urgent it is and how pervasive it is. Recovery is hard. Recovery is the hardest thing that most of these people will ever attempt. The best we can do is put people in the position and give them the right tools to make the best decisions for them. Not everyone does that. Not everyone is ready to do that. I have about 35 people in the program. About half of those are heroin charges. It's Ellen calling from pretrial services. Uh, just I help with housing, childcare, um, employment and just sort of monitor their progress. Hey, Tom, how have you been doing? How's work and everything? It's awesome, awesome. Yeah. yeah, we're short, more people at work, so I'm getting a bunch more hours. The requirements that I have to fulfill on my part are I need to have employment. I need to have steady residence. You have to be seeing um, a counselor, which I do. Um, I have to contact Ellen once a week. I'm going to a meeting today at 5.30. Is that N.A.? Uh, yeah. yeah. I have 20 hours of community service that I have to do. As long as I don't fuck up, you know, in a matter of months, both of these heroin charges will be off my record like it never happened and I won't have a constant reminder that I was a piece of shit for the most of my life. Many crimes have something underlying them. There's some kind of physical or social uh, problem that somebody is, is, is struggling with. I was the last one up here. Twofer. My mom's buried here and we sprinkled my sister. Mm -hmm. 
after mm -hmm. watching my mom die, like I built a wall, you know, like I don't remember what my mom looks like or what she sounds like. I don't remember much about when I was a kid. I've lost a lot of people to drugs, but my sister was different. Just to see that, you know, what it did to her and where I was at in my use, it was reckless. I was using so much just trying to escape and it wasn't working. If we can connect with people and address some of those underlying factors, we hope that we can prevent someone from getting caught in that horrible cycle of just reoffending and being punished, reoffending and being punished. In our view, it is appropriate to uh, perhaps go a little bit lighter or a lot lighter than the statute allows. I am not thinking in terms of the paradigm of the soft on crime, tough on crime trend. We are not dealing with individuals who well, if they were not referred to the program, they would be locked up safe somewhere. No, the traditional criminal justice response would have been to put them on probation or in jail for a short period of time. They'd end up back on the street. The revolving door would then kick them back into court and the cycle would continue. I'm not really home often, you know, with hunting season right now. And Work, we're sweet. I just been a spectator to my life, you know, just watching it turn around and just to how far I've come, like my family changed the locks on the house. You know, I didn't have a key. The doors are never locked now. There is no key. Like that's a big deal for me, considering I've had and lost the key many times. I can be happy now, you know, because I'm getting back to a normal person. I run a store. They gave me the key to the store. You know, when she handed me these keys, I could not help but to look at her and laugh. I'm like, you just handed me a relapse. You just handed it to me. But my choice, my choice is to not. One of the lasting impressions we would like to make is ensuring that this generation of substance abusers is able to return into the fold of society when they have finally beat their addiction. I've watched people struggle, I've watched a few succeed, I've watched a lot fail, and there's the just so much riding on this. Her being a single parent is, is part of a lot of what keeps her on track. But really it's all about the individual. One success is worth 20 failures.